All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Red Light Report. On today's episode, I have the pleasure of conversing with someone I met down in Miami when we were all at uh, Biohacking Congress in October. And uh, this gentleman was also at a light therapy booth. Actually, my mom was conversing with you quite a bit until we finally crossed paths later in the in the weekend. Right. But a lot of common interest, of course, with light therapy. And I'll have you get into that company here in a second. Though just a great person with a very keen mind, especially in that biohacking sense. And so, as I said just a moment ago, his name is Amate Eschel, and he is an entrepreneur in the biohacking and beauty fields. He has held executive roles in the health, wellness, and beauty industry for over a decade, as well as being a business development consultant in that space. As the co-founder and CEO of Young Goose, the biohacking skincare company, and a host of Young Goose's Biohacking Beauty podcast, Amate has been making waves in the industry through education and innovation. Young Goose, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, thoroughly here, embodies his two passions, performance optimization and skin health, with products that boost the functions of natural rejuvenation processes in the skin. Uh, without further ado, Amate, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm very, very excited, very uh, grateful for your invitation and to be here. Yeah, my, my pleasure. It's always great when we can cross paths with like-minded people and uh, just trade notes and kind of learn from each other and grow, especially with your knowledge and expertise in the light area. Like I mentioned right there in the opening, you were repping a brand called Zero Gravity Skin, which I would love to learn more about because even with our uh, superficial conversations at the convention down in Miami, I would love to hear more about what that company is doing, because in a nutshell for the audience, Zero Gravity Skin is essentially a very, very high end, like you said, the Cadillac of light therapies. It's very expensive. Yeah. And if you could, Amate, I'd love for you to explain what the company is doing, why it's so expensive, and the benefits of that light therapy from Zero Gravity Skin. Yeah. So first of all, that's going to be a fun conversation, I feel like, because I think we're going to get into things that are interesting for most people, but they're kind of above most conversationalists. Heads, so it's maybe not, not discussed much. So I was there as uh, a consultant for, for Zero Gravity, which, which that's what I do, right? I take biohacking brands and or brands who discovered that they're in the biohacking field, maybe stumbled upon the field, discovered their, their point of conversation there, and really translated to... Um, biohacking consumers and seeing how how those two meet. And that's what I, I was hired by Zero Gravity to do. And, and Zero Gravity is a very interesting company because it only almost exclusively makes super, super strong handheld devices. They're not interested in making whole body devices there. And, and there is some science to it, definitely not for the average consumer who is interested in whole body benefits or holistic benefits. You know, if we get into the nitty gritty of light therapy, the less of a surface area we're irradiating at once, the better results we're going to get only in that area. I mean, if I went into a, a chamber, like a light therapy chamber that wraps 360 degrees around me, the, the amount of stimulation I'm going to get for the wrinkle under my eye is going to be diminished as opposed to if I had the same amount of energy on one spot. So that, that's what they're concentrated in. And they're extremely expensive. So they're in the thousands of dollars per device. And when people from the industry, friends of mine, ask me, you know, is it the best device to buy for me? Or does it justify the price? M meaning if I buy a BioLite for a X amount of money, or do I take the same amount of money and just buy something that's going to treat a very small amount of area? Would I get my money's worth? And, and it's very important to explain that technology in general isn't linear. I like explaining it about cars, right? Like Mercedes costs triple the amount of like a Honda, but you're not getting triple the speed. You're not getting triple the comfort. It's not linear. So the advances in price are not necessarily getting translated one-to-one -one as far as the advances for benefits. It's just that getting something 10% stronger, better, more efficient can actually double the price of something. So the only reason zero gravity is 
and the products are that expensive uh, are because they're maybe 10 to 20% stronger than another handheld device. But the technology that goes into that, so a very, very, very strong battery that lasts a long time, they have like an extremely long warranty, which for handheld devices, not very smart, right? Because it's droppable. It's not like a BioLite panel where you can hang it on the door. And essentially, if you've, if you've, done, if you've done it right, nothing's going to happen to it. A handheld device, someone can distract you, you can bump into something and it can fall, right? That plus structuring 55% of the light, that's what they do. They have um, the same way that we can get into focus lenses, but they basically have 55% of the light going in parallel into the skin so it can abs get absorbed better. That becomes ridiculously expensive. I live in Miami, so I do see quite a lot of Rolls Royces, but you know, you live in Montana. You walk out the street, what's the chance you're going to meet a Rolls Royce? What are the chances you're going to meet someone who is interested in getting a Rolls Royce, right? There are so many other things along the way people are going to buy before they buy a Rolls Royce, right? And that's kind of the, the way I explain it. It's definitely not for everyone. It is for someone who has the urge, has the tendency, the ability to, to get a handheld device, especially because it's not going to replace a full body panel. It's going to be something you're buying after that to treat something specific. That brings up a lot of questions and thanks for that ex explanation. So who would this be targeted towards? Is it someone who's trying to do like anti-aging for their face, like skincare? Is it for like spot treatments for pain? Let's start there and then I'll have a couple other questions. So that's also very interesting because when I started, when I got contracted to, to work for them, the idea was, okay, we have this device that doctors really like, practitioners really like, either for pain, like phantom pain, things like that, or to increase the efficacy of, of uh, intra-articular injections or for uh, facials. And they really put the pressure on zero gravity and said, hey, we do have clients that can afford thousands of dollars per device that they're, that's going to sit in their closet and they're going to use a couple of times a week. We do have those clients. Can you please make it available for everyone? That was the natural you know, contingency of, of these products. And it's going to be for people who want a very strong effect by therapy in a very specific area. I couldn't stress enough the fact that it shouldn't be the first light therapy device that someone needs to get. Why is that? Because light therapy has so many benefits and most of the benefits are preventative. What do you think is a better idea? To have a liposuction after you've had a life full of burgers or just eating healthy to begin with, right? Prevention is definitely cheaper and, and more effective than, than treatment. And that is why once you have like your red light therapy set up, you get full body benefits. You're preventing things that are going to happen later on. That's when I would suggest if you do have an acute problem, if you have something specific that you want to apply light therapy to, that would be when you, you want to get it. And just for clarification, does the handheld device have both red and near infrared and yeah, it does. other frequencies or uh, it, et cetera? It does have both. And the reason it has both is because they really do serve the same purpose, right? If it would have also blue light, for example, which is great for antibacterial purposes, it wouldn't be serving the same purpose. And that is a problem in a handheld because if you only have a surface area of, uh, of your, the palm of your hand, right? The size of the palm of your hand, you're limited to the amount of diodes you can put there. And one diode really cannot shift wavelength. That's not how it works. And by the way, I think that's a good PSA because we see a lot of products like Amazon or whatever products with like seven colors. Someone needs to understand that they're really buying maybe like two diodes of red light, two diodes of near infrared, two diodes of green, of blue, of purple, whatever that is. So the reason they have both red and near infrared within it is because the purpose is similar. Maybe the depth of penetration is a little different, but it's one purpose per device. Well, that's a good segue into to my other question is uh, with the power, and this is going to be kind of a, a technical rabbit hole question, but my understanding is with power, more is not better. So the theory of this device of it being so high powered 
is kind of the antithesis of some red light therapy treatments, especially for skin. Because from my understanding, skin treatments are very low dosage relative to, let's say, treating bone and joints or the brain. So can you kind of explain yeah, why sure. a quote unquote high power device would be so beneficial when yeah. sometimes you actually want a lower dosage? For sure. For sure. First of all, before we get into the answer to your specific question, yeah, we do want lower power. And in general, the old school name for the treatment was low level light or laser therapy, right? So it's in the name. But when you're talking about a handheld that you're moving a lot and you're going to be moving it on the face, you do want a higher power than something that's going to be static. That's number one, because really what you're doing is you're accumulating stimulation. So if I move the device, the accumulation would look a little bit different. That's number one. Number two, when we're looking at a a, something that covers a larger area, we're really looking at relationships between a few things, you know, reactive oxygen species, nitric oxide, ATP. So there, there are like three things, actually 12, but there are really three things you should take into account. Whereas when you're moving something around, you're more looking at just one of the three, which is like ROS movement or, or like signaling for repair really. And the rest don't express themselves as much if you move something around. If you were to keep it on one area, for example, so the same device, you could be moving around your face, it would be working great, but it has a lot of power where if you stuck it on the side of your knee where it hurts and didn't move it, that's going to be the same device used differently to treat a joint or, you know, a muscle whatever that may be, uh, for, for pain purposes. That makes sense. So that, that's a good clarification is you're constantly moving this, especially if it's on the face or if you're treating skin. So it's not like it's just sitting in one place for minutes on end at a high, high dosage. It's constantly on the move. And then if you did want a, like a high power dosage to a deeper part, like the joint, like you're saying, there are benefits to that because it's tough for light to penetrate so deeply and have enough photons to make enough of a difference. So that's where the high power would come in. And one of my questions was going to be, is this device kind of tailored to brain health if it's so high powered, especially with the near infrared and it being able to penetrate the skull? Is the zero gravity skin, I know it's like skin, so predominantly skin health, but can it be used for brain health too? So I had a very, very, very interesting conversation with a doctor out of uh, UC Davis who stacked Eight, basically, he called them yamakas because he took skulls and, and, you know, cut them and stacked eight on top of each other and showed that more than 1% of the light penetrated those eight skulls. So definitely, it's something that could benefit uh, brain health. But as far as looking at companies like Violite and some other companies that are looking specifically to uh, photobiomodulation for the brain, Wavelengths in the 810 nanometer realm seem to be the go-to option for them. And again, that's very far from, from my specialty. So I wouldn't be able to like say, oh, that's the best. But that's what they've been looking to, to use. And that does not exist in that device that we're talking about in the, in the uh, zero gravity device. So even though it can have benefits, it wouldn't be if someone wanted to buy a specific of brain photobiomodulation, probably they can get better bang for their buck and better wavelengths for that. Gotcha. That makes sense. And then lastly, on, on this zero gravity uh, device, you said something to the effect of it with uh, the lenses, I believe, it being able yeah. to produce parallel waves and why that's more efficacious. Could you kind of explain that a little further? Yeah. So we're trying to do it with any light therapy panel in general, because if you look at a, a diode, a diode has 180 degrees of light emission in general. So if you look at your car, if you look at a panel that you have, if you look at even the small handheld panel you have behind you, they have a type of reflector in the back that really gathers this light and directs it into a more specific place. When you do it in that form, even though it's great, there are some give and takes as far as temperature, as far as like having to cool this. There, there, is, there is a relationship there. 
What zero gravity has, which is unique, is a mesh, a grid. You know, it's basically glass, but it's like hundreds of layers of that small glass that allow the photons only to pass when they're in 90 degree angle. So it's not perfect. It's not like 100% of the light is going to go there. It's about 55% of the light goes in 90 degrees. And what that allows the photons to do is to basically have less skin to go through until they reach where we want them to go, whether it would be the inner layer of the skin, where if you want the skin benefits, that's where you want the light to reach. It's called the hypodermis. Or if you wanted it to go to all the way to the joint, or we, we were speaking of the brain. So for the real beginner, I always like to explain that the sun, if it's high up in the sky, you feel warmer than if it's close to the horizon because there is less atmosphere for the wavelengths to go through, for, for the light to go through. So the less material we have to go through, the less wasting of energy we have and more energy we have where we want it to be. So in essence, is that equivalent to saying it has better penetration or getting more photons deeper because it's parallel? Yes, but not not in the way where it would be classically just more photons deeper because that would assume all the photons get absorbed well but that's not the case that's why if we did just a panel that looked like a mirror with led lights and really it would be just 180 degrees of light emission you and i if we stood in front of that panel a lot of the light isn't going to reach us isn't even going to get absorbed in our body it's going to bounce around the room by having the light or a lot of the light go directly to one area or just straight on, it's not only about the penetration, it's also about the amount of light actually reaching the skin, but it's kind of both. It's like the concentration of photons is great. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, cool. That That's pretty interesting device. High tech, like you said, not the first device you definitely want to purchase necessarily, but for those that can afford it and potentially are more skin oriented, but you know, potentially other benefits, that's something to look into. But lastly, while we're on the topic of, of light, before we start talking about skincare and skin health and your, your company, Young Goose, explain to the audience, you know, how you utilize light and or red light therapy for health and wellness benefits. Okay, my favorite topic. So, uh, <laughs> so I am a lunatic. I love abusing my body to the extreme. So I train jujitsu once or twice a day, lift weights. I inject myself with peptides. I do many, many, many things, which I need my body to respond well to. Talking to surgeons about light therapy, I tell them that you are the artist and light therapy improves the canvas. So if I am the kind of the abuser, I'm not really the artist, but I'm the abuser of my body or I'm the person placing demands on my body. Light therapy really improves how my body reacts to those demands. Before coming on air, I was talking about the fact that I just pulled my ham- hamstring. You know, to me, it's the end of the world. It means that, that for a week or two, I won't be able to train. I would pay any amount of money to have a faster recovery. Any amount, everything in my bank account would go to the person that would tell me, okay, tomorrow you can train again. That is why I'm so grateful for for light therapy, because really what it does, it allows my body to behave like a younger body, my tissue to behave like a younger tissue and to perform the tasks that I asked it to perform, whether it would be recovery, whether it would be, we didn't talk about peptides, but whether it would be a peptide that I inject into my stomach and I want that peptide, which basically is like a healing peptide to disperse throughout my system, right? So I irradiate my body with red light therapy and then, you know, blood vessels expand and and blood rushes to the, to my entire body. And that allows those peptides to get to circulate better, whether it would be for, you know, we're going to talk about young, young goose, but my life's project is in, in NAD elevation so NAD is, is, is a molecule that the person discovered it won the Nobel Prize. It is touted like the, the closest we got to the fountain of youth. But this also needs to disperse throughout the body. It doesn't matter how you get it into the body, whether it be an, an IV, whether it would be a supplement, whether it would be our skin products. It needs to kind of travel throughout the body and it does it through our vascular system. So by improving that system, we can improve the way it disperses, et cetera, et cetera. So 
really to me, to summarize it is, it's a little time machine. It allows my body to behave like a younger body, which then my lunatic self just means that I can place more demands on it. Just doesn't mean I'm, it's going to deal with the same demand better. It means, oh, now I can place some more demands on it. That is kind of you know my go-to. As far as where I see it going in the future is how I stack hyperbaric oxygen therapy and light therapy. That's number one. And cold immersion ice baths followed with red light therapy uh, or even uh, preceded with red light therapy. I'm playing around with it to see if I get extra benefits and if I can push my body further. And that all makes sense because you kept saying over and over again, it makes your body feel younger or function younger, which makes total sense because we know that it improves the efficiency or effectiveness of the mitochondria producing energy. And of course, we all associate vitality with having energy, not like a caffeine rush, but just sustained energy. And so that totally makes sense. And when you were speaking on NAD, well, that makes sense because that's a very critical component in the electron transport chain, which has to do with producing energy. So it all makes total sense. And to your point, light therapy is extremely safe, effective, can help with so many different things. In your case, it's like you're wanting to recover from a hamstring injury as soon as possible. Well, what do you need for recovery? You need energy in order to heal. And then you brought up some great points at the end there with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and cold water immersion and utilizing those together with red light therapy. I've had multiple people on the podcast mention the synergy and stacking those together. And so I'm just kind of curious, do you have any research on either those working together as far as hyperbaric and red light therapy or cold water immersion and red light therapy, or is it just the synergy of mitochondrial health and, or just what you know, physiologically with those treatment modalities? You're spot on with your second hypothesis because, because really all of those three are grouped in the same group as no one with stands to gain a lot from researching them. There's no patenting involved there for the most part. There is no incentive for anyone to really research it aside from, you know, very specific people like the Weizmann Institute in Israel, which we work with actually for uh, NAD um, elevation. They look at HBOT and they do look at light as far as getting uh, some cues from the body for like brain bleeding and stuff like that, but they're not looking for profit out of it. So also the more interesting thing for the wider audience, which would be how do I improve an already functioning body to function even better? That's not really what they're doing. They're doing it for either like serious illnesses or again, like I said, brain bleeding. So the research is not there. The uh, common denominator, just like mitochondrial health, Yes and no, because if I just expanded a little bit more, we would be looking at stacking hormetic processes, stressful processes, which lead positive result. And obviously, we need to be careful with those stacked on top of each other. A good example would be metformin, which is a drug that people take. Obviously, it's it's made for diabetic people, but it is stressful on the mitochondria in a positive way. It is hormetic. But we're starting to find out that if you did supplement on that and try to get the full benefits of lifting weights and having your muscles grow, hypotrophy as we call it. So these two together don't really work that well. We see the kind of the same thing with cold immersion and hypertrophy. So when I say I play around, I really do play around. I really kind of try to see how I feel afterwards when I work out, et cetera. And that is why I would love to see some research, but in the meantime, it really is in the realm of how do I stress my body and have it react positively. Gotcha. That's a good point. Hormetic stressors, stacking them up, kind of just like if you were to do uh, fasting and pair it with exercise, because exercise is a hormetic response as well. (laughs) And actually red light therapy is compared to exercise a lot as far as how it's a hormetic response. And like you said, incorrect dosages are in moderation. And consistently over time, you get those positive adaptations. Any other thoughts on, on red light therapy before we move on? Yeah. So thoughts on red light therapy. A lot of people ask me, like, what device should I buy? I have a lot of friends in that field where they regard me as a light guy or something like that. They ask me what device I should buy. Obviously, I, I try to save people money. I don't want people to buy the, the most expensive device off the bat. But the 
flip side of that, I don't want people to buy like a 200, 300, 400 dollar device that really would would not do much more than putting your TV <laughs> only on red and, and having that shine into your eyes. A good you know starting point uh, on a device would be a device that can give you benefits if it, if it radiates on a significant part of your body. And a good rule of thumb I, I tell everyone is if it has vents. So if the device has needs the, the ability to cool itself down and it has a cord running to the power source, that would be the two things that I would start with as far as like what red light therapy I should choose. And then the rest is really looking at a company that is looking to give you good information, good information as to how to use it because it's so multifaceted. So just a company that can talk about their device how to use their device the best because device do di devices do differ a little bit. So making sure that you're not getting ju just generic information because you could buy, there is a great Ari Witten book, Red Light Therapy, but it is generic. Like good luck trying to figure out how much power you're going to get at 12 inches away with a device that you bought off of, you know, some website or whatever. So really looking for a company that has a lot of information about their device is responsive seems to be sticking around and going to respect their warranty, which is important. Just make sure you use it a lot. If it's going to sit in a closet, it's not going to do much. Well, I'm really glad you brought up those points because I think a lot of people are under the assumption that red light therapy is like a hard and rigid technology where like everything is cookie cutter, which is why I developed that ebook that's on, on our website. Because like you said, there's a lot of variables that go into a quote unquote treatment dosage or a treatment protocol. And like you said, that varies from device to device because there's different light irradiances. People use different lens angles, which then makes a light dispersion difference. So then that throws a wrench into the difference in distance from the device. So it gets very complex. All of that to say, it's relatively simple in the sense that get in front of your device, get exposed on a consistent basis. Know some of the fundamentals, like not to overdose, know which uh, wavelengths you need to use for certain things. You can make it very simplistic, but when you get down to the technicals, like you and I kind of are right now, it is rather complex. Like you said, you need to know the light or radiance of your device. You need to know, um, hopefully they're providing you with instruction, like you're saying, like, uh, what is the light or radiance at six inches or 12 inches or 18 inches? Because that's going to differ from device to device. And then based on what you're trying to treat, that's going to change, A, do you need red and or near infrared light? Secondly, how many joules of energy do you need to see a benefit, you know, based on the research? And that's going to be different from thyroid health to brain health to sleep and anxiety and athletic performance. All of that to say kind of, kind of a rabbit hole, but it's relatively complex, yet, like I said, can be simple if you want to simplify and just use it for general health. And as research continues to come out over the months and years, I think we're going to get more and more defined ways of how to utilize this technology. But right now, like you and I are saying, we're trying to piece the puzzle together as the research comes out. But for now, like if you want specific protocols, like on skin health versus whatever you want, immune system boosting benefits or, or sleep, you do either A, need to know how to read the research or B, find someone or an entity that's trustworthy and has done the due diligence to synthesize the research and, and trust their protocols. So it's kind of the wild, wild west. With all of that being said, it's very effective. It's very efficacious. It's very safe. And it's not like if you get a device, you're putting yourself in danger if you overdose by a couple of minutes or even five or 10 no. minutes. The benefits are going to be there if, if you use it generally well. I know that was yeah. kind of a diatribe, but I'd love to get any thoughts you have to add on there. You know, just to touch on safety, the amount of so overdosing is extremely far from uh, stimulation for light therapy. So you would be literally falling asleep, drowsy, and feeling, you know, very lethargic way. And when I say way, it's like an increment of like 10 or 100 times before you're going to be really overdosing. Unless you have the specific mission of overdosing, you're not going to do that. And there are so older, really, really older protocols from like the early 2000s had had used low level laser therapy to shut down a nerve, basically to overdose a nerve. Obviously, we've 
stepped away from that because the <laughs> nursing that nerve back into health is a, is a nightmare. So no one does that anymore. But that research kind of showed how we can overdose if we wanted to. And that's a pretty tough thing to do. Just as far as safety concern, it's amazing. Obviously, now, you know, another safety concern people have is like ha- have it shine into their eyes. And we are actually so there was um, was it Medical News Today just published an article about how it can help eyesight. So really, it's an extremely safe technology to use. The only risk is really not using. It. So that's that's the truth. It's what I love about it is there is a uh, very good uh, physical therapist. He's out of uh, Sweden that says. If you've solved something in one treatment, you've misdiagnosed the problem. So the problem was different. And that's what I love about our body. What we do on a consistent basis, what it what takes us some effort to do, and we build on successes. Not only is that the way to go, it's also the way for us to build a good habit. And it's also a way to have a continuous stacked benefit upon benefit upon benefit. If you're looking for a silver bullet, well, guess what? Not only that it doesn't exist, if it exists for something specific, it's probably not healthy for you as a human as a whole. That is across the board. We did speak about cold immersion. The flip side of that is the rice method, right? In the 70s, there was a rest, elevate, ice. Compression. Um, yes, compression. But the person who coined that phrase literally came out in the late 90s and said that that's the wrong way to go. So cold immersion is awesome. I think something to to oblivion uh, actually has counter effects as far as injury recovery. So bear that in mind, small increments over time, Trump, silver bullets, any day of the week, that's how I approach anything as far as biohacking, wellness, whatever that is. Yeah, just a step back to your your initial points. When I was speaking on overdosing, I wasn't speaking from the point of like overdosing on, on drugs or like over the edge. When I meant overdose, I meant kind of like the biphasic dose response where if your dosage is too high, then you're not going to see the benefits you're looking for. And that doesn't mean you have to do half an hour, 60 minutes or a couple hours. I'm saying like maybe the treatment dosage for the device you're using for what you're trying to treat, let's say the perfect time is like five minutes. And yeah. you're under the impression that you need to do like 15 or 20 minutes every single day, when in fact, that five minutes is actually what you needed. That quote unquote overdosing would just lead to null effects, nothing negative, but you just wouldn't see the benefits you're looking for. That's more so what I was speaking towards. Yeah. And, and that's that's awesome that, that, that you made that clarification, because it does connect to that overall uh, scheme of small increments over time, Trump, one, wham, bam, whatever, treatment in anything in anything. Yeah, those five minutes are more beneficial than 20 minutes as a whole. Exactly. Well, yeah, to your point, like five minutes, most days of the week. So you're spreading out the benefits versus one lump 20 minute treatment once a week. Yeah, so that makes sense. And then lastly, Amate, before we move on. So my initial question was, I think, do you have any other thoughts on red light therapy? And you kind of went on what people should look at for devices. And I get this particular question quite often, because people are wanting to invest in red light therapy, they just don't know, quote unquote, which device I should choose. And so I'd love to get your thoughts on if someone's ready to invest, they're just kind of sitting on the fence wondering which device, would you recommend if money's not necessarily holding them back, would you recommend a full body device versus like a tabletop version or even a handheld version? Would you recommend that full body device to get the full body systemic benefits? Or are you still more of the mindset that try smaller, see see if you like it, and then upgrade, or all in on the full body irradiation? That's an awesome question, and it is biphasic, and I'll explain why. I like full body. That just let's just put it out there, okay? And when I say full body is not is not a pod, is not like a bed where you go inside. I'm actually kind of partial to those, but I like more or less full body coverage within 24 inches. So something that's going to be the size from your head kind of to your pelvis or your knees, if you were really standing close to it, would be something I like. It could be shorter. It could be the size of your torso-ish. That's my favorite sizes. Where do I see issues with that when you say money is not an issue? When money is completely not an issue, it's also not an issue as far as moving around, having multiple houses, and having uh, 
uh, very, you know, on the go kind of life. And then if someone would have a panel that's five feet long or six feet long, good luck schlepping it around, right? You might want to buy a few of those for each and every house you have. My dear friend, uh, Dr. Neil Polvin, you know, he thinks that 2022, one of the health realization is that people should have light therapy in every room in their house. Go outside. Yes, that's, the sun that's, is. <laughs> that seems to be, yeah, that seems to be an overkill. But yeah, I think you get my point where yeah. it is, as far as biphasic, it means make sure that you have a device that you would be using consistently. If it needs to be smaller, that's great. But I do believe in holistic benefits first and then going smaller. Gotcha. Okay, great clarification there. So Amate, let's move on to some more skin health stuff and like your company, Young Goose. One of the questions I had for you was like, what topics are you most excited to speak on? And your answer was skin health as a reference point to monitor our biohacking journey. Can you please expand upon that? You know, skincare is tricky because we did speak about like small increments and being better than a big result, which is unsustainable. And I think the appearance of, of youthful skin literally is the epitome of that. And what I mean by that is if you went and you're 60 years old and you decided you looked better 25 years ago and you went and had a facelift done, you won't be able to do another one in a few months, okay? So, or, or in a year or in two years, actually it's recommended not to do it more than once every five years. And that's also a stretch, no pun intended. So that is a kind of a more aggressive method of looking younger, which obviously is not optimal, especially not for us biohackers, especially not for someone who is interested in longevity because going under the knife quite literally shortens your life. Having said that, looking at the state of the skin, as long as we're doing things that are conducive to our health, can really kind of give us a reference point as to how well we're doing in our wellness journey or in our biohacking journey. And to put it more specifically, there has been research correlating between the appearance of your skin and your biological age, which is different from the chronological age. The chronological would be looking at the calendar, seeing how old I am. Biological age, we have different biomarkers that we can test anything from the the way your DNA gets expressed to different markers as, as far as blood markers, hormones, etc. So there are many clocks that we can refer to, but in general, there is a huge correlation between the appearance, how young people say we look, and our biological age, which obviously wouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. So when we're talking about this biohacking journey, which could sometimes be frustrating, right? Uh, let's talk about the easiest thing, which is supplementation. I can take the best probiotics, fish oil, different longevity compounds, and really not see results for a year, for two years, for three years. But the problem is, is that we're also, we didn't see results negative results in the first 30 years of our lives. Aging takes a while. So anti-aging would, it would beg that anti-aging takes a while as well. And starting out my entrepreneurial journey in health, in the sciences of beauty. So the first project we ever did was hair care. And then uh, obviously I got contracted to different wellness products to, to consult for them, started my own skincare company. I'm, I've really become convinced that we can incentivize healthy living through the appearance of youth. And as long as we make that correlation very clear, the better you treat your body, the better you're going to look, the better you sleep. Obviously, the better you're going to look. There is a reason it's called beauty sleep, but the less inflammation you create in your body, the more muscle mass you preserve eliminating bad things from your routine diet, artificial light, et cetera, the better you're going to look at the end. And that incentive can definitely be a good, beneficial, but also more or less vanity can also be a, a positive driving force there and really propel you to a good wellness journey, right? Because that's the 
the bottom line. We're all, as human beings, we're really conditioned to experience life as it is right now. We're, we're really not thinking how we're going to feel about ourselves in 10, 20 years. You literally need to clean mind tricks on yourself to do that. But the truth is you're going to be a person experiencing their life in 10 and 20 years and the decisions you make today are going to decide who you will be in, in, in 20 years. You know, the big phrase that within seven years, every cell in your body would have changed. And in seven years, you're really not the same person. So whatever you're asking yourselves to do now is going to manifest itself in the future. Connecting between healthy habits and healthy habits that contribute to skin appearance, whatever, is to me a little evil plan to get people healthier in the long run. Yeah, that brings up a lot of good points. Like you're saying for anti-aging longevity, it's basically like a game of delayed gratification because of course you want to feel as young as possible for as long as possible. You kind of increase that health span. And so you do have to be proactive versus reactive. And like you're saying, it's not always easy. You have to play a trick on yourself to kind of make yourself do things now to help yourself in the future. But, you know, this is a great topic, especially skin health, because I think that's probably the number one or number two reason, maybe with pain, why people look into red light therapy. So this is a great topic. And that kind of begs a question of, I want to get your standpoint on sun exposure and skin health, because of course, there is a skin cancer, wrinkling, that's DNA degradation that's associated with overexposure or excessive exposure to a UV radiation. So I'd love to get your take on sun exposure. Is it healthy? Is there a, a healthier way to protect your skin from the sun other than these toxic sunscreens and so forth? Yes. So exactly like you're, you're getting asked a lot about the red light therapy and skin. We're getting asked a lot about sun exposure and skin health. And when are we going to come out, come out with some biohacky way to, to shield ourselves from uh, UV rays. Addressing first the, the natural habits that, that are going to allow us to get reap the full benefits of sunlight without some of the more harmful effects is obviously having the sun, again, closer to the horizon when we do get sun exposure. So, you know, when, when I talk to people who are really, really interested in light therapy, I explained to them that our body evolved to use red and near infrared light. And the way it evolved to use red and near infrared light is because these wavelengths are not getting absorbed well by water. And when the sun is close to the horizon, that's almost all you're getting. Your body, a lot of it is made out of water, over 70%. When these wavelengths undisturbed travel throughout our body, our body evolved to use them as a signal. And that is really what we want to get from the sun, those wavelengths. We can do it by exposing our skin to the sun before 10 a.m. or like after 4 p.m. And that's, again, it obviously it depends where you are, et cetera. But these are some of the ways that we can get good, healthy sun exposure. And when I say good and healthy, I really mean, you know, 20 minutes on average of direct sun exposure a day. Going back to red light therapy, because again, it's a beloved subject for both of us, exposing ourselves to red and near infrared light therapy, such as in a piano, before going to the sun, has been shown to prevent some of the pigmentation of, and, and DNA damage that is involved with exposure to UV rays and the blue light in the uh, sun rays. And by the way, blue light that we also get from computers, etc., is also not very beneficial. It's actually damaging to our skin. So in general, it should, it should be addressed. So it's not only uh, sun exposure, it's also the exposure to HEV, which is a type of blue light that we get from screens and artificial light. As far as shielding ourselves with a physical shield, like a sunblock, do you remember when we grew up, we were growing up that uh, lifeguards used to have like a white powder on their, on their nose? That was zinc, uh, zinc oxide. And that right now, many, many companies, Alta MD has a product like that. Many companies have sunblocks that use a micronized version of that zinc oxide and another compound that's called titanium dioxide. And they make a, a brand that I love is called Tizo, T-I-Z-O. They also have tinted ones, et cetera. These are what I would look for as far as sunblocks. 
And why is that? It's because, so normal sunblocks, they get absorbed in the skin and they actually absorb UV light. You can imagine like a lens inside your skin that absorbs those wavelengths. The problem is, is that it creates thermal effect and the sunlight in general is also a stimulation for detoxification. So when that light hits us, our body wants to detoxify and rele release toxins. That film actually prevents some of the toxins leaving the skin to leave the skin. And that is a like really a harm upon a harm. So it's not only absorbing those toxins or absorbing those chemicals and uh, chemical SPFs. It's the, the combination of them trapping toxins on the top layers of our skin and concentrating them there. It's that thermal effect that happens when they absorb the UV light. So it's bad on all fronts. Zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, they act more like a physical repellent. So light bounces off of them. And that allows us obviously to enjoy some of the benefits of sunlight, repel some of the harmful effects of, of UV light and, and blue light. And that is a better way to go about it. So when we look at mineral sunblocks, uh, we can flip the bottle. So any sunblock is actually a drug. So they have to say what's there. We flip the bottle, we see if it says in active ingredients, if it says zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, if it says anything else, they're saying mineral, but it's not really mineral. So maybe not use that. And nowadays you can get ones that are micronized. Again, they're not becoming white. If you're of a darker skin and you're afraid of these materials, be, you know, lightening up the skin a little bit and not looking natural, there are ones that are tinted that are great. So there are ways to go around it. There's no need to use chemical sunblocks. Gotcha. Totally on board with that. Do you believe that if you were to expose yourself without any barriers, expose your skin on a consistent basis to the sun, that you'd be able to increase your exposure time over time to the point where you could be outside for hours without needing a sunscreen or anything else and not get any negative side effects of, of that quote unquote excessive UV radiation? Well, I believe that our body can evolve or can ad adapt to uh, sun exposure. And obviously, you don't need to believe me at all. Just don't expose yourself to the sun for five years. Go out for an hour and you're going to become a tomato, basically. But if you did it for 10 minutes at a time, increasing a little bit, obviously, you're going to get a very nice color unless you're from northern European country. And then it's going to probably take you longer. But you can, obviously, our body is, is an amazing, amazing apparatus. It's going to adapt and adjust. The problem is, is that there are things that happen on a chemical level. So the degradation of DNA, for example, that really are almost a separate issue. So they're not an issue of getting a damage on a physical level. It's a damage in the information. Basically, what happens is that we have letters in our DNA. And when UV hits them, so we have like four letters and one of them is called T. And those T's, if they're next to each other and UV hits them, they basically link up. And then our DNA in that area is less readable, takes more energy. You, you, the, the body can repair it, but it's a lot of energy to repair. Doesn't do it very well as we grow older. So to answer your question, probably if you're very young, you could play the game a little bit more. But especially if we're talking about older skin, someone's 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, and they decide now to, to play those experiments, that's, I don't think it's going to happen. Sorry to tell you, as far as that goes. And also, I don't know if you wanted to do that. I mean, again, what, what biohacking is as a whole, just as, as this philosophy is really understanding what are the positive views we're getting from the environment, distilling them and stripping the negative aspects of the cues that come with them and kind of getting all the positive without the, the drawbacks. So right now with red light therapy, with infrared sauna, normal dry sauna, obviously, and um, different things that we can do as far as supplementations, like vitamin D, for example, we can really bypass or skirt around those uh, harmful side effects of the sun, getting about 20, 30 minutes, even if we're in, uh, at our 60s, 70s, and really getting all of the good without any of the bad. Okay, that makes sense. And like you mentioned, this was actually going to be one of my questions because I saw on one of your um, Instagram posts on Young Goose that you were talking about how to protect your skin 
from the effects of screen time, like you're saying, the blue light. So can you go into that a little deeper? Because because this is important in the world we live in. We're surrounded by screens and this blue lit technology. So kind of go a little deeper into that and the negative uh, ramifications it has on our skin and our skin health. Yeah, so we classically were used to thinking that UV light is the culprit for for skin damage, right? So that's what, you know, UVA, UVB, that's what's kind of out there. But really what is being neglected is artificial light and especially a type of blue light that's called HEV, which basically just means blue light that goes in high velocity. And so blue light is a shorter wavelength. So the photon really goes through the skin a lot of times kind of in a short amount of time. And that friction does create literal physical damage, drying out our skin as well, by the way. And when I say drying out our skin, I I was talking to someone with an oilier skin in her 70s, which is awesome. She looked amazing recently. And she said, well, you know, I never worry about dry skin. I actually worry about oily skin. And if you've ever done a like an experiment with not washing your hair, you would know that the fact that your hair is oily literally signals to the body to create less oil. And that is obviously in our scalp. Our scalp is the organ that is called the skin, and it also exists in our skin of the face, body, et cetera. So drying the skin literally, some people is just going to create dry skin, but then some people is going to exacerbate their oiliness in the skin. And uh, that's very important to understand. So it's, I'm not only talking about people with dry skin, talking to anyone. It's disrupting the way that your skin is managing its oil production. And that is why if we're talking about blue light, which can be amazing for something like acne, that's also not something you can just have at it and use it just until your skin is completely healed every day, all day. No, it's also something that needs to be in moderation because that blue light's harmful. And that blue light exists in artificial light in abundance, because when we're talking about a computer, TV, halogen lights, et cetera, their mission, quote unquote, is really just to provide the most amount of light for the least amount of energy. So they create a lot of that high velocity blue light, which aside from being uh, harmful to your eyes specifically, it is creating physical damage in the skin. So how do we counteract that? We can do it in a few ways. We have substances that, such as, by the way, ashwagandha, or what you would see in skin skincare products, we're going to call it uh, winter cherry. There are some antioxidants that do that very well. And one of them is water-soluble vitamin C. And there is also a, a vitamin C form, it's called THD, that does it. And in low percentages, so around one to three percent, it actually improves how our uh, skin reacts to this blue light. So the same way we were talking about red light therapy and how it helps us, our skin kind of react to the sun damage from, from sunlight, same way we have compounds that can help our body handle that damage from screens and also some compounds that help our body repel that damage from screens. It doesn't mean that we should apply sunblock every, you know, 20 minutes when we're sitting in front of a screen. That would be an overkill. But using, you know, for example, our bio-C peptide spray, which which basically, I'm going to so happen to have it here because I'm in front of a screen, right? So applying that every two hours, that has that water-soluble vitamin C and some peptides. And this, this whole product's designed to act also like a toner, but also as a protectant against that. Uh, HEV, all it does is help our body negate the the harmful effects of HEV or artificial blue light. So that's a that's a young goose product for people that are, yeah. are watching on YouTube that he was showing. So Amate, can you go a little deeper into that as far as like what is that product called first of all, and then like how would someone utilize it if someone like me, I'm in front of my computer, unfortunately, way more than I want to be. So how would someone like me? Uh, utilize that product to kind of salvage my skin from all the blue light technology I'm surrounded by. Okay. So because again, this is a, so this is a product called bio C peptide spray. This is a product that is just like a refresher for the skin. So if I work in front of a screen for more than two hours, for sure, I'm going to reapply it again, but basically just spraying it on the skin, you can spray it over makeup. It's very, it absorbs like extremely fast and it creates a layer 
that allows your body to kind of counteract the effects of, of that harmful blue light. You know, a lot of people buy $10, $20 of just aerosolized thermal water or whatever it is in CVS and just literally spray water on their face without any benefits. They can just go in and sprinkle water on their face. What we did is we took that pet peeve of people and we've infused it with some benefits that would actually allow them to handle harmful pollutants as well as blue light. So that would be something you would be using every two hours when you're in front of a screen, negating the effects of uh, blue light, which could be, again, dryness, it could be pigmentation, it can be more wrinkles. So it's definitely something we want to do on a continuous basis. I mean, that's something about a majority of the population could utilize because, again, we're surrounded by not just computers, but tablets and cell phones. So is it the same thing if I, if I know I'm going to be on my phone for extended periods of time or my, my iPad, same thing since it's blue light technology, I can use that spray to help negate the blue light from harming my skin? Yes. And, and it's a yes overall, because we're waking up, most of us, unless we live in, in Montana, most of us are going to go outside and we're going to be hit with sunlight. We're going to be hit with pollution. We're going to go back indoors. There is artificial light in our office, computers, tablets, phones. So it's almost like everyone in the world should be basically spraying it on their face every two hours when they're out and about or working. You brought this up just now. So I'm going to ask, would this help with the fluorescent lights? Because people who are working like yeah. in cubicles or whatever, it's like same thing, fluorescent light, because it has bright white and sometimes high high velocity blue light as well, right? Okay. Yes. So, so it would help with that too. Well, so so that's an interesting product. Tell us what else, Amate, the Young Goose has as far as your skincare products, what's revolutionary and, and cutting edge about them? So what we started the company because of, and really what we're the most invested in is a patent that's called NR Noble. And that patent is designed to increase a, a molecule called NAD in our skin. So just to give you an idea, because a lot of people don't know what NAD is. So again, I mentioned it before that the person who discovered it won the Nobel Prize. That was over 100 years ago. And what they thought it is for the longest time, for 80 years, is just basically the waiter or the taxi of electrons in your mitochondria. So the things that allow energy to be created in the mitochondria. But as you know, research into longevity grew. And if someone knows uh, David Sinclair from Harvard and his book Lifespan, that kind of really popularized it. What we found out is that there are about 600 processes that look to NAD and they kind of are saying to themselves, because it is a type of fuel. So they look and say, do I even want to start this repair process? Is it, do I have even enough energy to follow through in that repair process? And if there's not enough NAD, that repair process, one of those 600 that I'm talking about, just is not going to happen. It's not like our car where we get into our car and it doesn't matter if we have half a tank of gas or a full tank of gas, the car is going to drive the same. If the repair process gets into its car, looks, and there's not a full tank of gas, it's just not going to drive that day. And we did speak of DNA damage, which obviously is a main a major culprit in aging. So the, uh, the genes and the enzymes that are responsible for DNA repair are one of them. And basically any repair process in the body relies on NAD, looks to NAD to see if it can even function. So that is why, you know, it is dubbed like the closest thing to the fan of youth we found so far. And we found a way to really make a cream that can raise NAD levels in, in the skin specifically. And capitalize on that with different molecules like resveratrol, CoQ10, PQQ, turmeric, B vitamins, vitamin C, kind of the kitchen sink, capitalize on that and really give the skin everything that it needs to repair itself. So we started with that product and being biohackers, we've perfected that product and then said, okay, now that the skin has the ability to repair itself, what do we want it to do? Do we want to ask it to repair something very specific? Do we want to do it in specific areas like the eyes or the, the face or the neck or the body? So we've designed, you know, about 10 products that would be, you know, familiar to people as far as how they use them. Is it a serum? Is it a cream? Is it a face wash? Is it a 
spray, whatever that may be. But within those products, our abilities to address specific things, as long as you use care, which is our main product, uh, as their moisturizer. So that's the kitchen sink I spoke of that has the ability to raise NAD levels in your skin, wherever you put it on. And then we have around nine other products that can capitalize on that and do specific things, raise hydration and fix the way that our skin hydrates itself, treat wrinkles and collagen production, really fix how our body creates, where our skin creates collagen and elastin. We have a specific retinol product that because of the combination between this and the retinol product doesn't even leave the skin red or irritated or flaky or anything. So that product can turn over our cells, renew our cells. So that's for like, whether it would be wrinkles or pigmentation. So we're really biohacking the skin in a safe and a really effective way. And the results that we, that people are getting from it are ridiculous. So anyone who follows us, us like in social media or anything like that, we have a lot of those uh, clients that, that we share their stories and, and it's pretty amazing. And again, again, for me, someone who had the vision to create it out of scratch is very fun. Yeah, that's very cool. Congratulations on on all the skincare products. That's amazing. Thank you. I know it's not easy to put that together and, and, and bring it out to the world. So to have um, as many innovative products as you do is, is really astounding. So congrats on that. Um, Thank you. And just for folk like Amate was uh, alluding to, their Instagram is Young Goose Skincare. So go check out those pictures to see the skincare improvements. And kind of just to touch on this and, and hopefully not beat a dead horse, but w- with your skincare products, like you're saying, you're improving NAD levels specifically at the skin level and locally wherever you're putting this cream on versus someone who's supplementing with NMN, NR, niacin. That's more systemic. So I'm guessing if you are doing that NAD supplementation, that's being dispersed amongst your entire body. Whereas with your products, it's more a higher concentration is going directly just to the skin. Thus, you're seeing these amazing skincare improvements via the increased NAD levels. Is that a somewhat decent synopsis? Yeah, we wanted to do a product that gets absorbed through the skin. When we started, we actually wanted to affect the body systemically. Just we, we've, we didn't manage to do it. Everything got soaked up by the uh, skin locally. So the raising of NAD level as far as supplementation is a quarter billion dollar industry at the mo- moment, and it doubles itself every year. And when I started you know, getting NAD IVs, I used to pay more than $1,000 per IV to get, yeah. Wow. And I had to sit five hours, at the beginning, like eight hours, with a needle stuck in my arm, getting those, those uh, molecules uh, drip into my bloodstream. And when we started developing it, which was almost a decade ago, that was the real need. We wanted to find a way to activate those repair processes through NAD without having to pay $1,000 every week or so. Back then, really, uh, supplementation wasn't an option. But now that the supplementation is an option, it's very important to understand that our skin, aside from it being an enormous organ, and that if we take a pill, it's not like we are asking it, okay, so I just want to raise NAD level in this wrinkle right here. No, it goes from head to toe, quite literally. Uh, But also the skin itself is one of the last organs that are going to enjoy it if I took NAD as a supplement. 95% really benefits the liver. So that's great. But Imagine that I took a pill, I took the highest maximal dosage I can, I paid a few hundreds of dollars a month, and most of that, 95% of it, seems to stay in or benefit the liver, and 5% goes systemically. And that's why the IV market, not only that it's not dead, it's even growing more and more and more, because that's kind of our way to bypass the liver. So when we made a skin cream, we were aiming at bypassing the liver and bypassing $1,000 a week. Fortunately and unfortunately, we found out that if you supplied it locally to the skin in a way where it would actually get absorbed because that wasn't easy, it would uh, get absorbed locally. And just to touch on a, on a point uh, that's very important, it's not as easy as just you know taking one of those supplements, breaking it up, <laughs> you know, pouring it into our existing skin cream, 
and voila, it's going to work. If you remember like 10 years ago, all the skincare companies used to have collagen in their cream. Then the consumer found out that collagen doesn't really absorb through the skin, or if it did, the skin has no idea what to do with it. It needs to kind of create it on its own, right? The same way with uh, NAD. So NMN and NR, which are the building blocks for NAD, are the available molecules for the body if it's, if it's not within the cell. So the body has no idea what to do with NAD if it's not already within its cell. It has to use NR and NMN. And they are extremely volatile, volatile molecules. So they degrade very fast, basically. They react very fast and they change. So our journey for, for a long time was how do we make a, a cream that's going to sit you know, next to your other skin creams three, six months is still be effective as in day one when you put it on your hand and then put on your face. So that took us a long time. Is there any interactions with light with your creams or like, is there any benefits to doing, let's say red light before and in, in your young goose creams after or vice versa, just given the part that, that it works with the mitochondria seemingly with, with the NAD levels? 100%. And uh, we actually make a product that is specifically for light therapy, but I would, again, like if I had to, put a hundred dollar anywhere, it would be on the one that raises NAD levels, but something very important to understand. Yeah. Your mitochondria relies on NAD to create energy. We use red light therapy in order to ask the mitochondria to create energy also to improve how it creates energy, but we kind of stimulate to create more energy. So there is a synergy there. One thing I would say, it's not as easy as let's put a cream on or let's do light therapy and put a cream on because what we're doing again is we're giving the building blocks to create NAD. And that actually, so NAD peaks eight hours after, whether it be supplementation, whether it be application. So the best would be, let's say, to use our cream in the evening and then use red light therapy in the morning. Obviously, life is not static. We, we can't plan everything out. So if we just use our cream, which is called CARE, uh, this one, if we used it twice a day, morning and night as the moisturizer, and then just had high levels of NAD throughout the day, and then just did light therapy when we felt it's appropriate to do that, that would be the easiest way to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. When you were talking, I was thinking, what are other hacks or suggestions or supplements that you would advocate for relative to skin health that people could do and complement with your, your skincare, red light therapy, that type of thing? So something that people are starting to hear about is senescent cells or zombie cells, which are cells that our body didn't recycle well when they basically died. They're staying in kind of a zombie state. They infect other cells in their condition as well, by the way, but they just create inflammation. They don't do anything else, just inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. And obviously that creates damage leading to cell death that leads to uh, premature aging, what we call inflammaging, et cetera. And what people don't know is the highest amount of senescent cells are in the skin because it's, it's the largest organ, right? So uh, using senolytic or senescent cell scavenging products such as fisetine, spermidine, extreme cases would be using something like rapamycin. Those products would be conducive to skin health as well. And really, we have, you know, two labs that we collaborate with. We collaborate with the top of the universities in the world as far as like longevity. We created a product that, that is a senolytic, uh, but we're not the only one. To be fair, there is a product called OS1, One Skin. The research is, is in Petri dishes, so we don't know how well it works in live humans, because the, the joke is that it's very easy to cure cancer in a Petri dish. And we don't know how it works in humans. Our products we tried in humans, but our product is quite expensive. It's $120 per product. So if someone doesn't have that available cash, other modalities would work very well. So fisetine is pretty inexpensive. Again, we said um, people should you know look to research it. There are, there are peptides that do it very well. And again, one skin, I think costs around $90 or something like that. So that can be a cheaper option if someone's interested in it. That would be number one. Number two would be red light therapy. Obviously that is for, for many reasons. So 
some little hack that is known as far as like skin health is improving uh, blood circulation to the skin. The more blood gets to the skin, the better the skin's going to do overall. So obviously that we, we know that light therapy expands blood vessels where we shine the light on, and that could be very beneficial. As far as, you know, getting more blood into the skin or more oxygenated blood, we did speak about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, so that can be another modality that is that is very, very beneficial. Some controlled damage. So microneedling, retinol, anything that you can do to damage the skin on a very micronized level, on a very low level, which then the skin needs to repair itself. What I would say, any of those modalities, you do have to be careful with sun exposure. Okay, because that compounding effect isn't positive. Recommended doing them at night, in the winter, times that sun exposure is lower. Yeah, and you know, you brought up a good point when you're talking about those ways to improve skin health in the fact that the skin loses circulation as we age. So I forget what the exact numbers are. I learned this in one of my physical therapy courses where I was learning dry needling and in yeah. one of the courses, we learned cupping as well. So I was going to toss cupping into the hat for improving skin health because cupping is amazing for improving circulation to the skin. The guy who founded the course, his name is Dr. Ma. He and his wife, the story was they would, they would cup each other's face every day for skin health. And if you looked at this guy's picture on the back of his textbook that I bought, his skin was so smooth. He looked like a 20 year old, but he was like in his mid seventies or eighties. It was, it was amazing. So um, I think it's around your forties, thirties or forties, you lose, it's an astounding number of the percentage of circulation you lose to your skin. I don't know if it's like 40, 50 or 60, but it's a high number of the yeah. circulation you just naturally use. So like to your point, any way, whether it's red light therapy or, or micro needling or now cupping, if you can introduce a way to get consistent blood flow to your skin, keep it hydrated, keep the nutrients coming in, the garbage going out, you're going to keep keep your skin looking healthy for a long, long time. Um, yeah. So I love all those ideas. Yeah. Also, just you reminded me, Gua Sha is good too, which Gua Sha means like using a stone and 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 that is this, uh, they contoured to the face basically and you're you're applying you know very low amount of pressure but you're applying pressure and moving uh, liquid into the lymph nodes easier which helps with clearing of toxins which you've, you've just mentioned so that would work very well and i think would be remiss if we didn't mention the two staples two of the staples of longevity one would be mitigation of stress and the other would be good quality sleep, which we kind of mentioned before, but these two, the same way they benefit us as, as, as people and, you know, for longevity, that is exactly, and we've went over it again, and again, and again, that is exactly why they would be beneficial to our skin. Stress exhausts stem cells. It exhausts, it's basically also constricting blood vessels. All of that would result in aging skin, and my joke is you can look at every uh, president, United States president ever, how they've aged seemingly 20 years in a four-year or eight-year period. And that is due to stress and obviously lack of sleep. So sleep is our body's way to re repair itself. And we need to obviously allow it to do it in the best way, because that's all we're talking about here today. It's repair, the stimulation of repair and the facilitation of repair. Yeah, and on the topic of improving circulation, obviously this to the skin, um, another way I'll throw in the, into the hat is nasal breathing, because simply breathing through your nose exponentially increases your nitric oxide production, which is a vasodilator. So something as simple as breathing through your nose versus the easier path through your mouth could also, I'm not saying it's going to directly benefit the skin, but it, it just makes sense. It came to me as we were talking that if you can increase your, your NO levels that that would seemingly somewhere down the path, help your skin as well. Yes. And, and if anyone ever uh, wanted to look more into that, I love the work that James Nestor did. His book, Breath, yeah, is I, I think book. very, very easy to read and very kind of comprehensive. And he goes over how changes of nasal or uh, oral breathing changes the structure of our face, which obviously would contribute to how we look. That's like a series of podcasts to do only on that. And obviously people wrote books on books on books on that. But yeah, nasal breathing is super important. Uh, we actually here 
tape our mouth when we go to sleep to facilitate nose breathing. And we use nose strips to open our nose and, and uh, allow better breathing. So that's very, very, very important. Yeah. Something that seems so simple, but has profound effects. What do sure. you do or if yeah. you don't? Um, well, Amate, this has been a really, really fun conversation. Very enlightening. Is there anything else you want to mention about, you know, red light therapy, skin health, biohacking before we sign off here? I mean, again, I think everything you just mentioned, biohacking in general, red light therapy, skincare, all of those are growing fields. They all are reliant on new and emerging information. Source your, your information well. Make sure you're connected to good sources of information. Obviously, we're trying to be one of those. BioLight is an amazing source for that. And that is exactly what, so the person who listens to that pod, to this podcast is doing the right thing. So they should do more of that. Definitely follow us on Young Goose Skincare on Instagram. We're starting also a series of blogs right now to kind of facilitate that even further. And it was a, an honor and a pleasure. Honestly, it was amazing for me. I know. I feel like we could go on for hours and hours and hours. We'll, sure. we'll definitely have to have you back on. Um, yes, sir. But on, but on top of the Instagram, Young Goose Skincare, Amate, where else can people go to learn more about you uh, and what you're doing and, and Young Goose itself? Basically, we, we really take it upon ourselves as a mission to kind of educate and to make sure that we are a purveyor of, of correct information. So we are working on starting rele to release blogs, a sign up to our newsletter. We are releasing newsletters on very like really in-depth looking at the nitty gritty of of things that are maybe not for everyone, but if, if you are kind of a nerd for that that kind of information, that would be a good a way to start. So obviously go to our website, sign up to the newsletter. And we're constantly investing in refining that message, looking to have it accessible to everyone, having amazing people. We should we have to have you on our podcast for sure. I'll be there. And yes, sir. Yeah, that's exactly the way to do it. Small increments of information, educate yourself. Uh, get courses. Uh, maybe the last thing I would recommend is uh, going on immersive experiences. Uh, if anyone follows someone amazing like Natalie Nidham, uh, she just had a retreat in uh, DR, which I've heard like amazing things about. So that's obviously, that's not benefit, benefiting me specifically, but that's something that I feel that if you have the time and the money, you should do because immersion and getting yourself in your core level identified as, as a person that biohacks themselves, that's going to allow everything to flow uh, much better. And uh, yeah. I love it. So everyone, go check out Amate um, and his company, Young Goose, younggoose.com, uh, Young Goose Skincare on Instagram. Go check out his products, learn more from him. Obviously, he's going to have a lot of great education coming down the pipe with his, his newsletters and blogs. So go check them out. And again, Amate, appreciate your time, man. Appreciate your education and expertise. We'll, we'll definitely have you on again in the future and, and we'll make it happen. But, but again, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. For, for Amate, Ashul, this is Dr. Mike Belkowski signing off another episode of the Red Light Report. Everyone have a fantastic week.